what we're going to focus on is uh, the barriers and uh, connect that with innovation. So uh, the oper what are the barriers and how does that lead to opportunities for innovation? Because I think that's a hallmark of uh, UCSD. And uh, we heard just uh, uh, some of those in, in the last uh, presentation uh, beginning to talk about some of those things. So while the panelists are thinking about that, um, first we'll start with the panel and then we'll op open it up for some questions, if that's okay with the panelists. I feel honored to have such a distinguished group. So I, I wanna talk about uh, a barrier and uh, something that, that I had some experience with um, and uh, how uh, that situation was um, resolved. And that has to do with um, when I was at uh, the National Institutes of Health, I always wanted to get uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the NIH, and CMS to work together. Um, it's interesting that each has, uh, there are three sets of enabling legislations for those. Um, and uh, they have uh, different missions, they have different restrictions, and it was something I suppose I spent, um, I was at NIH for almost 30 years and probably spent 20 years trying to figure out how to deal with that um, conundrum. So one of the things I did is I talked with uh, some senators and representatives in Congress because there, there's a tendency uh, to think that um, uh, we just write a, a new law, a new policy, and we heard some discussion about that today, about how can we get um, uh, uh, and deal with the policy and, and that that'll cure everything. And I think, oh, I shouldn't even use the word cure, um, but I, I think there's a, a, it's an oversimplification of what the difficulty is. And so when I talked with some of these um, representatives or senators, uh, their comment was pretty much universally the same. Are you crazy? Um, and here's th the reason. Each has enabling legislation. They go through different committees within the Congress. Uh, and each committee has something on the order of 30 members and uh, 60 staff members. So roughly 100 people on each committee. So if you, you probably have had the experience of uh, standing in a circle and you start a story and the story goes around and when it comes around to the other side it doesn't sound anything like the story that you started out with. You, know, you start out with ten blues and one red and by the time it gets to the end it has three greens and four yellows and and it doesn't, uh, it's not. So the legislation, if you start out with some hope of some legislation having a common goal, for instance, those three agencies working together, um, wouldn't happen. Uh, it probably would make them more uh, separated than uh, actually uh, reaching the objective. So that being the case, um, I then focused on how to be innovative within existing policy. And uh, it's one of the things that uh, uh, I've had some success with and encouraged others to do that, and uh, they've uh, found a way uh, to achieve that. So what I was able to start before I left NIH was a, uh, a registry for patients that was co-administered by the three agencies. So uh, it's, as you, most of you know, I work in the area of artificial hearts and ventricular assist devices. And so this is a registry for patients that are receiving those devices, including Dick Cheney, by the way. Um, so it's uh, a registry where it meets the research and clinical objectives of NIH, uh, the regulatory objectives of the FDA, and the payment uh, requirements of uh, Medicare and Medicaid services at CMS. And so. Oh, you did turn it off? Yeah, I turned it off. How'd you do that? I'm 
It's <laughs> <laughs> right behind you and everything. Well, that's okay. So it's it's called the Interagency Regis Registry for Mechanical uh, Assisted Circulatory Support. If it comes up. It's coming. I can see it. Panasonic. Mm -hmm. hmm. So this is the uh, registry, and that's the acronym Intermax. Intermax. And um, so talking about. Uh, networks of information, and as all the speakers uh, who have sp so far spoken have mentioned, the importance of, of uh, evidence and data. So right now there's uh, 52, 52, 5,252 patients that have been registered from 119 hospitals in this registry. Um, the the uh, NIH makes decisions about research activities. The uh, FDA uh, now uses it for uh, device reporting and for control groups for uh, subsequent clinical trials. And the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services uses it for payment decisions on an annual basis. What's unique about that is the average time for a payment decision is four and a half years. Uh, with CMS, which you um, experts probably realize. Um, and so that's the average. So some is less, three years, others are six or seven years in payment decisions. So this, they make a payment decision a annually, if not in a shorter period of time, which is uh, really quite uh, remarkable. So the, the point here is uh, innovation within uh, opportunities when there's a barrier. And uh, so with that, I'll uh, uh, start with the panelists to uh, uh, address this, uh, this same issue. So uh, Claude, how, if we, how about if we start with you? Have you, you've been thinking a little about this, I think. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess, uh, Innovation is about driving change through, um, through inertia. And uh, in this case, uh, the, you know, it's, it's particularly difficult because the inertia is a systems inertia. It's, iner it's an interdependent inertia, and there are many actors, as, as actu actually you pointed out, and maybe I'm going to add a few more to yours. Uh, it's... Um, the, uh, the providers, it's the insurance companies, it's the legal systems, the lawyers, who clearly derived an economic value from this whole thing. Uh, it's the regulatory agencies and the FDA, which initially was created to protect the public, but which has now a life of its own and a political life of its own. Uh, it's the pharma industry which is, even despite of the rhetoric, on a paradigm of the blockbuster model, which is completely obsolete. And, uh, and all these actually, the, despite of the rhetoric, uh, all these institutions actually have very little incentive to disrupt the status quo uh, because they all derive their existence from the current state of affairs. And therefore, we're seeing some of the presentation of this morning, like uh, the one that you had, uh, the skyrocketing healthcare cost. Uh, so the question is, uh, those are, those are those, every, every one of those is, is, every one of these institutions create barriers of their own, and when they actually collide, this is an enormous barrier. So the question is, is there hope here? And uh, 
I wouldn't be in technology. I wouldn't have a technology career if I was not career if if I was not an optimist. So so the the answer is absolutely. <laughs> uh, and the hope comes from. Um, the patient, because when you, you know, you, you notice that in every one of these groups of interests, I didn't mention the patients once, and it's 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 actually paradoxical that the person who is the <coughs> primary beneficiary of all these decisions doesn't have a seat at the table, and I think it's critical at one point or another that the patient regains the power, the voice that, that he and she uh, are entitled to have. So how? Well, the first is awareness. In this country, unfortunately, there is the accepted wisdom that we have the best healthcare system in the world. So, uh, and you know, if you start now actually get digging a little deeper, you find out that that all the statistics actually are, are worse than in a lot of places. So the first thing is education of the patient that there's, there's, there's probably a better way. The second one, and this is now back to the main topic of innovation, the innovation has not only to be technological, but it has to be socio sociological. And we, as part of, of getting innovation adopted, uh, we have first to cater to the patient. Now, I can give you a few examples of my past life and my past car career. When we introduced digital mammography back when I was at GE, uh, this was one of these era where there was an overzealous attitude of the FDA and they decided that uh, digital mammography was gonna have to be subjected to PMA for pre-market -pre approval, which is the same kind of test as a drug. 3,000 cases and exactly the example that you mentioned this morning, you need a lot, of a lot of money to do the clinical trial, therefore a lot of patients, but then you don't have a lot of patients. So, I mean, it's sort of the doom loop. The doom loop. Um, well, what, we, what, what happened at, at that time is, uh, to make a long story short, we, uh, we actually had the 3,000 patients because uh, the DOD and the VA had funded that on clinical, had funded the clinical trial as part of the development of digital mammography. Uh, but what we did after that is we advertised directly to the, to the patient and saying this is a technology that had potentially much better outcomes than traditional mammography, which, which, which really helped. Um, so, again, and I'll stop here to leave, leave uh, time for the other uh, uh, members of the panel. I would say use technology to drive a sociological revolution. The, the, the best example in maybe not in your life, but in my life, is contra contraceptive pills completely changed the, the attitude towards uh, reproductive control. Com that was actually more a sociological revolution than it was a technological revolution, and that is what is needed in healthcare. Um, Dr. Matthews? Do, do you want to uh, comment at this point on? Sure, I suppose I completely agree. There are lots of these barriers in place, and the barriers slow us down, basically. Uh, I think that the barriers change very slowly, but they do change. I think this country realizes the depth of the trouble that it's in, and they are starting to change more quickly than they have in the past. But I suppose innovation can either work within the barriers and find the little homes and, and do small changes within the barriers that presently exist, whilst doing the background work for the longer term directional pull of where we want to go with things. And we can use uh, people, we can market directly with people. People are getting motivated about this. People do care about looking after themselves. You know, people, I know many people who are not insured at all anymore. 
They say, I'm going to self-insure. It's just ridiculous. I can't afford it. So I think that the barriers do exist. I think we have to look at the opportunities that we have as entrepreneurs and investors. If we want a short-term payoff, find a way to exist within the present CMS codes and change things for the better within those codes. If you want to be more disruptive, think longer term. Think about how am I going to change these things for all more external forces that, I, that are going to take longer to control. Now, there, there, there's an area that I, I wonder about, for instance, in the, in the wireless domain, um, the older population that is the most um, uh, demanding of res uh, health resources are, um, you know, less savvy. Yeah. And uh, how, again, going to the consumer that you both uh, mentioned, how, how do you see addressing that? I, I see that as a huge barrier. I think it comes back to my, our belief of um, independence of both the infrastructure and of compliance. So if I'm an elderly person and I have a guy come to my house and fit my house and I don't do anything, if the system is seamless, which we don't have right now, you know, these things fall over, but if we work towards a system that's transparent to the user, it doesn't matter what age you are. Well, that, that would be. I think that's where we've got to head with these things, honestly. I think that the independence of having to do anything is what we need eventually. But yeah, my, I bought my grandmother a video player and she, she won't even put the, di the video in. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, there are these, these complexities. Having said that, there are some people who are great who can do just sure. Thing, right? so. Sure. <clears throat> Mark? Yeah. Um, so I think about this from perhaps a more clinical perspective. It, it, there's no doubt, you know, we're in difficult in a difficult time right now. The conversation about health is not about curing diseases right now or, you know, brand new things. It's about containing cost. And that has all sorts of implications. The, the presidents of device companies that I know are being offered turnkey operations in third world countries to do all of their innovation overseas. Um, so we're, we're in tough times. Having said that, you should not be discouraged for two reasons, I think. Number one, history would say, I think, that it's when things are at the darkest moments where the greatest opportunities arise. So when everybody else is running for the hills, that's exactly the time for you guys to hunker down and think disruptively about what the potential solutions may be. Because you're smart, you're well-trained, you have smart people around you, and this room could have many of those solutions. The second set of barriers that I would talk about that's not on a national level, because heaven knows we've got plenty of them there, is on much more of a local level. And, and here's how I see this. So I'm a surgeon. My dad was an engineer, was an electronics engineer, and uh, so I've got a lot of engineering uh, DNA running around inside <laughs> of me. Uh, and I could tell you lots of stories about that, but I think that's why when I went into, I think it's one reason I went into surgery, and it's why I sort of turned into a surgery device geek and liked robotics and minimally invasive surgery and all these things. Um, when I was at Hopkins, I got a guy named Russ Taylor who wrote almost all the mechanical patents for the Da Vinci robotic system. I got him to come into the OR with me. And he, so he brought a mechanical and a computer engineer's eyes into my operating room. And he had, you know, eight and a half by 14 yellow legal pads. And he walked out with about 12 sheets of, this is in the early 90s, 12 sheets of paper filled with, you know, why is this over here? Why do you do this that way? I mean, he was looking at it with completely different eyes. Uh, and what I have found in my career to date is when, when talented, smart engineers and computer scientists can really get with clinicians, magic can happen with all sorts of clinicians. It, it, it's perhaps most obvious in surgery because what we do is so visible and mechanical and tactile. But I think it's true across the board, radiology, internal medicine, family practice, public health, you name it. When you get those people together, now why... What are the barriers to successfully getting those people together? Well, there are three. There are time barriers, financial barriers, and cultural barriers. The time barriers are that all those clinicians that I talked about are now on a hamster wheel 
to make their money. Uh, so th for them to have free time to sit and think with you, they've got to buy that time back somehow. That also is the financial barrier. But there's, a, there's also a cultural barrier. Uh, when you know, We've been working a project with some of the folks at Cal IT Squared, and you know, surgeons just think differently. We want stuff done yesterday. You know, and my dad was an engineer. He was very methodical in plotting, and every box has to be checked. And it's, it's, they're two different cultures. So it requires some cultural understanding almost to have that successful match be made. But I think that to me is really the promise, is for folks like you to really understand what some of the clinical challenges are, you know, both the socioeconomic ones we've been discussing, but also the real live clinical ones. You know, I would tell you, it's, it's, uh, this is being video recorded, so I have to be a little bit careful. <laughs> okay, so, you know, in the 1970s, when I was in college and medical school, we talked about curing cancer, curing diseases. I, I'm sitting next to somebody who had their career in GE. There's a terrible cancer out there, pancreatic cancer. It's, I don't know, the third leading cause of death among cancer victims. It's, you know, if you get it, you've got a real problem. The key to curing pancreatic cancer right now is early diagnosis. This gentleman's company could do that. CT scans can find pancreatic cancers at an early enough stage for us to cure them. But nobody is having that conversation because the costs involved, nobody will even think about. But I can tell you, if we could find a way to screen for that disease, the death rate would drop like a rock. And that's not even, we're not even talking about that. So, you know, hopefully somebody smart in here can find a way to do that diagnosis, you know, for $5 instead of 5000 or 50000 or whatever it is. So those are my thoughts. So I just want to build on that a little bit. Um, I, I think it's incredibly valuable, not as for engineers to sit next to, to physicians and surgeons, but it's also very incredibly powerful to sit next to patients and understand their story and understand their, their what they go through, because you, you'll build a lot of insights. Um, in working with Novartis, we're working on a tra enabling tr some of their transplant drugs, and um, we did a lot of ethnographic research. We went out and talked to folks. Uh, I met one folk, uh, one, uh, one person in particular, you know, he was, he was a type 1 diabetic, uh, uh, had a heart-lung uh, transplant, um, and you know, went through a lot of complications. And I asked him, you know, what was the toughest thing that he had to go through? And he said, the depression. The depression of, of knowing that, you know, yeah, there's a lot of hope that comes up when you're about to get your transplant. And you think once you get your transplant, life is going to be great. But when you come out of that surgery, you feel worse than you did going into it. Um, and a lot of rejections happen at that, you know, the, the time past that because you lose hope. So the system is not only therapeutic, it's not only, you know, devices, it's not only the surgeries, but it's also a system of care in the community and what you build around that to make sure that they don't fall into that depressive state. So it's, it's a systematic, user-centric design that has to go, that has to look at all the different components to really uh, change outcomes. The uh, panelists, what, um, uh, in terms of consumers, what experience do you have with uh, patient advocate groups? So, so we work strongly with uh, NAMI, which is the North American Alliance for Mental Illness. They're very powerful. Um, I, I can tell you, uh, I have many stories, but I'll tell you one. Uh, Remicade was, uh, was having trouble getting approved by the FDA, again, back in the early 90s. And at the time, I was working at Hopkins and did a lot of inflammatory bowel disease surgery. And one of my patients was, um, and please don't take this the wrong way, a very beautiful young uh, female model who had horrible Crohn's disease, and she was one of my patients and one of my GI partner's patients. And at the time, Remicade was, was having an uphill battle to get approved, and it was on the docket as a potential orphan drug uh, in front of the FDA. Well, this woman went on down to Washington, D.C., and absolutely dazzled that congressional panel. And that's how that drug entered the marketplace. And who knows if it would be in the marketplace now if that hadn't been the case, um, one, of, one of today's miracle drugs. So <laughs> patient advocacy groups can have a tremendous impact. I, I think that's an important thing uh, to remember when you get interested in an, in an area 
is to uh, think about the patient advocate groups and and talking uh, with them. Dr. Matthews, do you? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great way of getting your information out to the public and enable them to talk to their physicians. You can come out at it from that direction. Multiple sclerosis is a good example. Uh, information flows very freely from those advocacy groups to the patients, and then they start asking questions of their physicians, and their physicians then start asking questions. So it's a great avenue that we should all. Yeah, I was thinking of that when, Claude, when you mentioned about, you know, going directly to the patient, I think these groups are good at communicating through newsletters and uh, other uh, opportunities with them. Well, there was uh, two or three instances the, <clears throat> the expression user-centered design or user-centered innovation. And I don't think, I think, I don't think we, we talked enough about that, especially, uh, you know, in, in, in the classic curricula. There's no innovation without users. So, um, and the user in this case, there are there's several users, but it's primarily the patient and the primary physician. Those are the two users of your future innovations. Yeah, just to build on that a little bit too, is, is the caregivers. I mean, I think um, one statistic is, you know, there's 50 million caregivers in the United States, and there's no tools for them, right? I mean, when right. they care for your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, and there's no tools that provide it for the caregiver to really uh, influence them. And a lot That's of times right. the key user is the caregiver. That's right. The burden of care is on them. So if you provide the right tools, then you can actually think about it. Well, I think just to build on it, it's not just the tools, it's the education. There's a huge amount of education missing in our system. We don't educate a lot of the tool givers and the patients properly in what the disease is about, what they need to do. Um, they go to the doctor, they get given a bit of paper, and then they go home, and they don't ask all of the right questions at that time. So I think there's innovation around education too. I, I had a lot of experience with randomized clinical trials and uh, informed consent. And it was my experience that um, in, uh, when someone talked with a patient after they'd gone through a long informed consent form, signed it, they'd read it twice what, with days in between or whatever the, in, the, the format was. Uh, for instance, uh, we had to be sure that there were, the words were so long you know, so many letters in each word, and you had to have met a, a frequency profile in terms of the wording so that it was simply, I forget the eight grade level. Is it eighth grade or sixth grade? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Sixth grade, uh, grade level for informed consent that invariably, if I asked a patient what treatment they got, they said, I got the treatment the doctor wanted me to get. And the idea of randomization never got through to the patient. So I, I, I don't, do you have any ideas about how to communicate more effectively with, uh, with the user? By the way, I, I, I like your, the idea of user-centered. What if we had NIH uh, giving grants for user-centered innovations instead of hypothesis-driven research? I mean, in addition to not, What? Trying to flip things like that on his head. Well, no, to add to, because um, you can have design-driven research, problem-oriented instrumentation research, hypothesis-driven, but we don't have a user-centered innovation research. Well, um, I, I would have two comments. I think um, IRBs, at least here at UC San Diego, and I think in Southern California, is, is part of the good news. Uh, we're fortunate to be in a community where uh, clinical trials and science are well understood. And we've been able to do some things here in surgery that our colleagues at Hopkins and Harvard and University of Michigan and, and uh, University of Washington cannot get done, either because their IRBs won't, aren't creative enough to allow it or their populations aren't willing to do it. Uh, so I think I think that's a huge advantage that we have here in La Jolla. Question, what's an IRB? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Institutional Review Board. It's it's the board that all clinical investigative institutions have to approve human studies, human review boards, and and they all do have to have a public member um, to to help. But but you're exactly right. Patients usually still come out saying, you know, I did I did what the doctor. <laughs> wanted me to do. Um, 
I think this trend towards towards patient uh, involvement is uh, is gaining steam. So, for instance, on all of our or on our main Morse Cancer Center board, uh, I think there are two former patients that sit on the board and deliberate with them about everything. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. And it's very helpful. Yeah, I think that's that's great. And in terms of IRBs, uh, every company has to, if they do a clinical trial, that trial has to go through an IRB. It's not something, they don't own the IRBs. The IRBs are independent um, and usually uh, hospital-based. They may be a research institute-based, but usually hospital-based or medical school-based. Um, why don't we open it up for some questions from the floor? Well, I'm going to cheat since it's my event and take the first question. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the microphone, so I shall. Um, so I appreciate your focus on the barriers. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, um, I think we've had some conversation about the barriers, and we've talked about some of the things that we want, but what 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 are the tools that will allow for us to achieve those next steps? Period. The majority of the audience here today is grad students or researchers. Um, and if they're not researchers at the institute, they're researchers in their own home companies or things of that nature. But what are those tools? Because I think we can have the long conversation. The media does a great job of creating this very dry out environment that I don't know and must be on teams to get it done. And must Cross collaborate and be systemic, but what are really the tools that it's going to take? And I, I mean, I can leave that open. I can go be any of those. But what are those tools? Yes. <laughs> so you mean tools for for people in the audience to go out there and get into this business and well, innovate and is yeah, that Yeah, I mean like the idea is you guys are at the forefront. You're 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 fighting the battle. You're in that boat on the storm or the perfect storm picture that you yeah. played. You guys are in there. And if you're not in there, you you, you built the ship that's out there, right? Like what, you guys got the, the group that's going to take us hopefully out of the storm into a calm land us on a nice sunny beach in San Diego. Oh, okay. No, um, what are the tools that are, I mean, if it's not for an individual, what are the larger systemic tools that it needs? But I think it's easy, uh, more helpful to hear the individual piece of that. I, I can try. I, I think this is not any different from any um, success endeavor, but it's pick the right problem, make sure that the problem that uh, that you're tackling is... It has relevance, like maybe early diagnostic of pan pancreatic cancer or any other one. There are plenty of those. And um, stick to it. Stick to it through the ups and downs and surround yourself with all the help you can get. And always, always have a vision of the final outcome because there will be lows and because if there's if it was easy the problem would have been solved a long time long time ago already so pick one have a sense of mission that you're going to save the world and you are actually and uh and uh, stick to it and stick to the vision and there are plenty of tools out there that you can engage in connect has a wonderful tool springboard program that people, if they don't know about it, should hop on the internet and find out about. They have. So reach out, talk to as many people as you can. Don't be afraid of calling up a physician if you don't know anything about something. If you don't know much about getting investment, call somebody up that does that sort of stuff. Don't be afraid of engaging people because you're gonna learn a lot more. Don't do it in vacuum because, and for your first thing, I'd suggest try finding something that's a little bit simpler. Don't pick the most difficult thing first time around. Um, get a success under your belt. Um, look perhaps at getting into the wellness market, which is a rapidly expanding market right now. It's on the fringe between medical and, you know, stuff. Wellness is a, a good initial market. You don't have all of those other barriers. Um, but reach out to as many people as you can, listen to as many people as you can, and stay focused. Yeah, I think 
think across disciplines, I mean, to, to build on your point, I mean, I learned a lot personally working with behavioral scientists and designers. You know, I'm a, I'm a technologist, I'm an engineer, I look at data all day long. Um, and they really opened my eyes on kind of what is really needed on the next application layers beyond the data to really effectuate change. Um, and, you know, I mean, and some, and it's all about innovation and across things that aren't necessarily regulated or medical in nature. And if you look at type 2 diabetics, you know, uh, um, which, which is leads to a lot of the complications down the line and a lot of the costs in the system, there's, there's le the levers are well known. You know, it's diet, exercise, education, medication. I mean, so they've come up with innovative techniques to deliver that information to frame the questions in, uh, in the right way. So I have three tools and one piece of advice. The three tools are your mouth, your ears, and your brain. <laughs> so you should use your mouth to connect with as many people as you can and use your ears to listen carefully to what they say. And if you are fortunate enough to be in an open environment like the university, don't be intimidated because this, this is one of the most collaborative universities I've ever seen or been part of. People. People who are world famous will sit down and talk with you. Nobel Prize winners will sit down and talk with you. That doesn't happen in Boston, but it does happen here. Sorry, dude. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in Baltimore. <laughs> doesn't happen in Baltimore either. Um, and use your brain. And what I mean by this is, you know, find some way to enforce creativity. And, you know, each of you has to figure out what that is, whether it's journaling, whether it's sitting on the beach, whether it is actually uh, formalized writing. Uh, but, you know, find some way to force your mind to use its creative energies. And my piece of advice for right now, because times are dark, similar to what these gentlemen have said, look for a cash market. Don't you know, try and stay away from the markets that the government is going to reimburse unless your idea is going to save money. Uh, <laughs> but there are plenty of cash markets uh, out there. There's, I mean, there's a lot of people digging in their pocket for whatever their perceived health good is. And so there are plenty of opportunities there. The, the veterinary market, for instance, yeah. <laughs> is a cash market that is a, a good entry point for a lot of things that can be used clinically because those conditions exist for uh, people's pets. Sadly. Um, I'll save my second question. I, I, just before, Dan, before you start, um, also some of the tools are here in the Von Liebig Center through the courses that uh, they give um, in terms of understanding uh, and, and the challenge that uh, Yashir helped uh, start uh, and some of you have competed in already. Uh, but in the future. But re remember what Steve Jobs has done, and I, I don't know of anyone that's done it any better. Here's a person who created products for people that they didn't know they wanted. And they, then they couldn't do without. And that's, of course, helped make, what's happened here at the university has helped make Proteus um, a, uh, a potentially viable company as, as they're just uh, starting out. But uh, compliance is a huge problem, so they picked a really good uh, goal there. Dan? Thank you. Um, I guess my question is also regarding barriers, but more on the, uh, I guess, political landscape since that's been in the news lately. Considering that, as many of you guys may know, like you were saying, barriers to politicians themselves have, many of them have made money under the current system, and that's how they're able to be going, that's how they're able to go into politics in the first place, making it very difficult for people to make innovation and change the system. So do you guys see this possibly changing in the future? The health care care bill did kind of change a couple things, but did address things like tort reform and other major things that need to get accomplished, and how do you see that moving forward in the next few years? Well, so I would say um, this, is, this is simply a fact. It's not a political advertisement. Elections have consequences. So um, I, I was an FDA panel chair for the GI devices and urology panel for, I think, about eight years. And when I started, it was under the previous administration. 
And when, you know, when you work for the FDA, you have to go for a half day of training before you start doing what you're going to do. And I went to my half day of training. And the message was crystal clear. Y you know, yes, we want things to be safe. And we want to pretty much know they're going to be effective. But we want the FDA to be a pipeline to get things out to the public. And then the public marketplace will decide uh, what's going to win and what's going to lose. That was, the, that was the philosophy of the FDA under the previous administration. That is not the philosophy of the FDA now. Um, but things go through ebb and flow. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very convinced that, uh, you know, just like waves come in and out, the, the regulatory um, burden will come in and out. I would say um, don't overfocus on it. I mean, we talked about the barriers, but if you pick the right, if you pick the right target, and if you believe in it, you will prevail. I mean, we've seen the adoption of PET for positron emission tomography. Uh, it was locked into the drawers of both the FDA and CMS for a few years until it finally prevailed. And CT PET is the norm for the imaging. Uh, the combined CT PET today is the norm for imaging uh, sensitivity and, and uh, specificity. So, three we, years, of three. It took four, three to four years longer, but it 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 succeeded. Yeah, the, uh, the 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 person that actually is really responsible for that lives here in San Diego. It's a breast cancer survivor, and uh, she was the one that. Uh, went to Washington, a uh, similar story to Mark's uh, story. She actually worked for the inventor, but uh, she uh, was very effective in eventually getting PET approved through the, through the FDA. So great ideas will win. They might not win in America, but, but, <laughs> but, but they'll win. And, you know, these companies are multinational companies now. Exactly. So... You know, if they, if they have a great idea, they're going to take it overseas. I've got a huge advantage in my Department of Surgery because one of my most creative guys is Argentinian. So when he can't do a clinical trial here, he does it in Argentina or Mexico. Yeah. So great ideas will, will prevail. And remember, this is opportunities for innovation. So we don't think there's any barriers, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, for our, for our story, I mean, going through the FDA, I mean, we've had... Um, I'm not the regulatory expert, so I'm probably terribly misquoting here. But um, we've had conversations in which they say it's completely unregulated at some regard because it's not providing any therapy, okay, any medical impact. Um, to to the, the other extreme that you're coupling to a medicine, so you need to be registered that drug, right? So, so it's very gray in terms of, you know, for our particular application, it's such a novel um, yeah. you know, combination drug that it's going to take a long time to get through. In Europe, we have CE mark approval for both, all our components. So we're going to commercialize a solution there in the UK next year. Um, and, and I think so showing value in the marketplace and that pressure will come overseas. I mean, the FDA will look at that and say, it's safe, it's valuable, people want it, you know, and then to come up with the right policies. Um, it, it, the FDA, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work for them right now with the, the mobile health um, blowing up and so many different apps coming out. And they, they don't know how to regulate it right now. They, they provided some draft guidance. So there's some you know, things that they've provided around how, how that thing's classified, but it's, it's a, the mountain of paperwork for them too. So they're trying to come up with the right framework. And I think it's actually, you're in a good spot because it's not the status quo. You see the numbers. The numbers are unsustainable. Government can't ignore the fact that our system can't sustain what's going on. So there will be opportunities for everybody to innovate in this area. So it's actually an exciting time to be in this area. If you look at where companies are moving, they're moving into healthcare because they see that there's a huge amount of opportunity for people to innovate and to get in here and to change the paradigm. So I think that the government's going to have to fess up to the fact that the system's broken very soon, and that's going to have to drive some policies. And you can take advantage of those as those policies change. Yes, sir. Um, I have some specific questions about the tools for innovation. Um, my first question is, assuming we want to adopt What is an effective strategy to reach out and incentivize the users to give feedback? And the last question is, I know I've already asked Dr. Matthews, but 
assuming we have a perceived unmet need, how do we market that to users who don't know that they want it? So they've got to tackle the first one around of sampling users. Um, um, so what we do is we don't we don't look at users in the middle, right? If you think of the bell curve, you look at the extremes. So for for instance, you look at the person that has no you know, real good ability of understanding what's going on, and understand their needs, and you understand, and then you go to the technologist and you understand their extreme needs, and somewhere in between is the solution. Um, and, and you don't really need a lot of folks to really understand the spectrum and, and where, where things lie. And there's a lot of good books out there, um, a lot of the uh, behavior change books, you know, coming, you know, a lot of the uh, design firms, Prog, IDO, um, they have a lot of really established, well established methodology around sampling. And, you know, I encourage you to read those books. Other comments? Yes, I think one of the very prin principle of user centered innovation and you mentioned now, IDEO is um, prototyping. So you don't need a lot of users for that. You, you can even start with one, but put in the hands of the user something they can see, touch, feel, and give you feedback immediately. And it doesn't have to be a sophisticated prototype. Actually, the rougher it is, the better it is, because then the user doesn't feel uh, that they're going to hurt you if they give you feedback. <laughs> if they see a, if, if they if they see a, a, a product in which you put a lot of a lot of thought, and uh, and and that looks finished, then people are a lot more reluctant to tell you we don't like it. Great, great point. I, I was going to bring up that. Uh, what what do you all think uh, constitutes proof of concept? Uh, the the von Liebig Center is a proof of concept center. And uh, I guess prototyping is for Claude. Uh, other comments? I think in the operating room environment, it's sort of what works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Initial demonstration. Which, you know, uh, we have a lot of companies that come to us wanting to know whether they're... so. In the device industry, the device industry is unique compared to the pharmaceutical industry because you have to have clinicians and companies work together in today's environment. You know, 30 years ago, a surgeon could say, I want to make this because it'll help me in the operating room. They go down the basement of the hospital and make it and use it that afternoon. Those days are long gone. So, you know, a surgeon can't dream something up and have it appear the next day. The companies, don't really know what the surgeons need. So if they don't work together, innovation's not going to happen. So we have a lot of companies come to us saying, you know, what do you think of my gizmo for, you know, sucking livers out or whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, that, that's sort of an initial stab at a proof of concept, and they usually walk out of our laboratory wishing they'd never come because they have <laughs> a long list of what has to be fixed. But I, <laughs> That's, that's the way it works in our environment. Any other comments on proof of concept? Okay. Other questions? I have my second question. Oh, okay. <laughs> you get to. I, I shared my mic. And I, I have it back. Um, so in the um, 70s, my time frame could be a little off, but the sort of hippie movement, my understanding of it was it was a way on some level, right? There's several different reasons or things that happen at the time. The one that I'm pointing to is the shutting down of um, markets and commercialization. People stopped buying clothes, they shared them with one another, they patched them up, and were really protesting some form of um, commercialization at the time. Um, my question is motivated by comments by Dr. Talamani. Um, how close do you think we are, and I think Dr. Matthews touched on this in his presentation, to people just revolting and just getting off the grid? Um, due to frustrations around receiving health care and feeling heard, and I'm not just saying by physicians, but in general by the whole system, right? Like how close do you think we are to having that possibly happen? I, I probably shouldn't answer. Cause Everyone's I, looking at you, Mark. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to say I have a little bit probably different perspective than the other gentleman on the panel. I have, so I have to be a little bit, I want to be a little bit careful. Uh, life expectancy has increased, what, 30 years over the last 50 years. 
So just think about that for a minute. Um, that is astounding. And, you know, in the 60s and 70s, <clears throat> Congress declared a war on cancer or that they're going to cure cancer. And they poured a lot of money, and they had a lot of money. The country was doing well. Uh, but look at, look at what's happened. Uh, it's, it's incredible that we can put an artificial heart in somebody and, and have them walk around with that. Why would that be cheap? Why would extending the life of breast, more than 50% of diagnoses with breast cancer now uh, get a cure or survive long term, longer than five years? Why would that be cheap? And what really is the value of that? That's expensive. Now, all of society is now saying, we don't want to pay that price anymore. But nobody's thinking about the other side of that. You know, um, now, I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of waste in the system. I'm not saying that our reimbursement and payment mechanisms aren't totally screwed up, because uh, they are. Um, and I'm not saying that some of our national health statistics aren't as good as other countries, because they aren't. Now, I think some of those reasons are socioeconomic and not medical. But when it comes to innovation, we are still, medical innovation, we are still number one. And if you don't think that's true, come down to the surgery department and look at all the different people from all the countries all over the world who are coming here. They're not going to many other countries. They're coming here. Now, you've heard that we're at risk of losing that because their clinical trial is going to be in Europe. It's not going to be here. And that's because we as a nation have said we either can't or we don't want to spend on that anymore. So I have a slightly different perspective. And you, know, you, know, you could talk about whether the quality of life in those later years is worth what we spent. I mean, there's lots of things to debate there. But I don't think we should debate the fact that we've spent a lot of money and we've gotten a lot of life. Uh, you know, it's just there. So I think there is this sort of turmoil, boiling of frustration, you know, and the system's broken and the politicians are having a lot of fun screaming about it and, you know, passing new laws and things. Um, but underneath it all, the country made a major investment in medical research over the last, what, 30 to 50 years, and in large part, it has paid off, in my view. Now, I know a lot of people disagree with me, but that's my view. I don't, I don't have the right numbers in place to, to quote, but um, you know, it's, not, it's not the devices that are the cost driver, right? It's not the initial procedures. It's the rehospitalizations because of the mismanagement of the chronic disease and heart failure. It's not the $30,000 pacemaker. It's the six rehospitalizations because if you're not titrating your diuretic correctly, that are the real cost drivers in that, in that equation. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of inefficiency in the case. Before it's outcome-based reimbursement, I mean, I think that's a huge driver, and a huge driver of, of I think, efficiency needs. In your presentation this morning, you said there's the perception, and actually that was the operative term, that technology is driving the cost. Yeah, I forget which group that was. Um, the reality is it isn't. The, uh, the bulk of the cost isn't in the technology, actually. Well, it might be because congestive heart failure patients normally would have died anyway up front, and we're keeping them alive with the technology, and now they're coming back. So it depends on how you look at it. <laughs> so that is very, very true. So I, um, it could be from that avenue. Perhaps, yeah. And, and to answer your question directly, though, I think it's going to get to the point where people just can't afford it. You know, it's going to be like, well, that's 35% of my take-home salary that I've got to pay insurance. And I, I can't afford it because I've got to put gas in the car and I've got to pay for the food. And so that's what I'm going to drop. And that's going to be at different thresholds for different people. The reality is as the, we get an aging population, something's going to have to, something's going to, have to happen. And uh, that's, it's going to be very interesting. So I'm just going to follow up on that and say, so what timeline? Nothing changed right now. When? It's different from different people. By like 2020, I think it was 35% of the GDP is going to be spent on health care, on Medicare and Medicaid, 35% of the GDP. That's huge. Listen, I, I, I like the manure story. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think we're going to have the uh, consequences that are being predicted now. I, I think we'll find solutions. Yeah. 
the uh, 30 years of extended life, um, it's, I think it's a little over three years is due to NIH research. The other 27 years is due to re engineers, sanitation, uh, clean water, uh, or at least uh, uncontaminated water. May not taste good, but it. <laughs> and it's kind of the same issue that we're having with energy. We've got the same problems with energy. The real, the real solution is stop us getting so obese and so all of these things that we can stop. We can stop a lot of these chronic diseases if we manage our lives better. Right. Yeah. And, and I think looking abroad, I mean, they have, they're facing just you know, same, same pressures, pressures and even worse. And, and if we're not careful and we don't, um, I think, fund innovation, they will become the innovation centers because they're facing real problems as well. Start lead, you know, they're they're, they're going to leapfrog our infrastructure because they just can't recreate it. So they're going to move on to the next thing. So we got to be careful. We got to innovate ahead of them. We need Steve Jobs types innovations, things that we that, that yeah <laughs> from UCSD. Well, and, that, for you. and it, it's quite true that that I mean the money is in the last year of life and chronic diseases, diabetes, heart failure. And you, it's, uh, you know, you can see that in where CMS is going because that, that's where the big pots of, of savings are going to be. But, I, you know, I, personally I think we're headed for a two-tiered system like Europe and most of the rest of the world because we've, we've disengaged the capitalistic aspect from healthcare. Um, you know, if, if, if I can't walk anymore and I need a new hip, I'm not going to feel much of that cost, right? Um, but do I have to have that? No. But I'd like to have it. I'd like to be able to keep walking and overall health, you know, my overall health will be better if I can keep walking. But who should really pay that, you know, $50,000, um, especially if I can pay it? Should all you guys be paying for it for me? Those are the kinds of questions that we've put our heads in the sand over, I think. Other questions? Well, I think we're just right on time, actually. So uh, I want to um, first thank the uh, Gordon Center and the Von Liebig Center for uh, this day and all the work of Ebony putting this together and to thank our panelists.